G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel as the AFL off-season drags on. I keep saying that because it feels like it's dragging and it is December 3rd. <sighs> Still like so much to go with this. But today I am uh, continuing my off-season series where I'm going through each individual club in the AFL and trying to do a little bit of a breakdown of the, where, where I see they're at, uh, trying to analyze their best 22, look at some depth options and maybe try and a little bit forecast what's gonna happen next for each individual club. So I've been doing it in reverse alphabetical order from the Western Bulldogs. I've done West Coast, St Kilda, Sydney, and Richmond most recently. And today we're gonna to do, do the Port Adelaide Football Club. As I said in the Richmond video, um, I've, I've really enjoyed this series. It's not necessarily doing extremely well on, on YouTube in terms of views or anything, but for two reasons, it seems to be well received to some extent but also I'm really enjoying the fact that I get to really deep dive individual clubs, which is not something I really get time to do during the season. I mean, I try my best and I try to react to things as they're happening, but this has given me a really good opportunity to, to really get a good understanding of where clubs are at. And um, yeah, I think it will make me better at what I do next year and beyond. So today we're gonna to talk about the Port Adelaide Football Club. Uh, before I crack into it, I actually just wanna give a shout out to a good friend of mine, The Pair. He's another YouTube channel who is a Port Adelaide focused YouTube channel. And I want to direct your attention to perhaps anyone who obviously likes Port Adelaide and is not aware of that channel. Go check him out because the man works tirelessly, has done for years on giving you the best Port Adelaide content on this platform. And absolutely go check out The Pair on YouTube. And I should have done the same thing for Saints TV who do a wonderful job covering St Kilda. Uh, seriously good channel over there. I want to shout out those two channels for giving you great club specific content. And you know, while you're in the mood to subscribe to people, just, you know, if you haven't subscribed to True Footy, maybe this is a good time to do it. Maybe help this man get to 25K by the end of the year. I like to set goals and every time, literally every time you guys have helped me smash my goals. So um, thank you very much. If you're enjoying the content, I uh, really appreciate the support. Now let's talk about the Port Adelaide Football Club. Uh, this was a bit of an up and down season in a sense for Port Adelaide. It, like broadly speaking, a successful comeback after a poor season in 2022. 2020 and 2021, they lose a prelim. One's a thriller, one's a horrible nightmare at home to the Western Bulldogs. 2022, they don't really come out of the blocks very well at all. They go 0 and 5, sort of rectify their season. 2023 is the where they pull their finger out. You know, throughout that home and away season, it was looking a little while there that Port Adelaide and Collingwood were probably going to be the two teams to beat. Port then sort of had a mid to late season lull and they kind of carried that uh, in different form into the finals where they're ultimately beaten badly in two finals, one to the Brisbane Lions at the Gabba and then to GWS where I think they only lost that game by three or four goals, but kicking one goal nine in the last quarter, the, it was just a really off day for the power. And it does continue this little trend uh, of poor performances in finals, it has to be said, um, which you can understand for a young group, uh, although as I look at it, it's quite a mature group now. And perhaps they're just going through that phase where they're accumulating, you know, bad experiences and, and experience in finals, and perhaps their best is ahead of them. But, you know, it is a bitter way to end what was otherwise a very good season. And it kind of leaves their fans, I think, in this weird dynamic where just got back on the Ken Hinckley train, things were going great, and then, you know, he signs a two-year deal and the season ends it with a very bitter ending. So what I think this season sort of demonstrated for Port Adelaide as much as anything is, is, is kind of a list transition in itself. We saw the young core, guys like Zach Butters, Connor Rosie in particular, really announce themselves. We saw some really good signs from Jason Horn Francis at times as well. He's obviously going to be a future gun, you'd think. And it was almost like a reliance too much on these, these absolute young guns. And uh, over time, we saw some of the older veterans who had previously good players for them and important players kind of look a little bit tired and maybe not quite up to it. And as a result, I think this offseason, we've seen a really big list refresh, particularly when it comes to key position roles. So before we crack into their 22, I, uh, I want to cover some of the, the delistings. And when I say delistings, I just mean players who left the club, as well as some of the additions this year, because it was a very active uh, trade period, it has to be said, for the Port Adelaide Footy Club. Um, very, very active indeed, and it's going to be interesting plotting their 22. It's quite a new look team. But relatively big name players that left the club, Xavier Dersma joined Essendon as part of the Brendan Zirk Thatcher deal. Scott Lysett retired, Tom Jonas retired, a couple of key position players there. They delisted Riley Bonner. They delisted Orazio Fantasia. He's gone to Carlton now. And then some other players like Sam Hayes, a young ruckman, Trent Dumont, Jake Passini, and Bryn Tickle. On the other hand, they did bring in plenty of ready-made players. And it does seem to be a bit of a hallmark of this 
Hinkley, Port Adelaide team to when they're at the top, sort of uh, load up with some uh, experienced, mature players. I, I seem to remember that around that time, uh, it's like 2015 to 17, I want to say, guys like Trent McKenzie. I mean, Trent Dumont is another one. Um, and then even Jack Trengove was there for a little bit. We've seen them cycle through mature players quite a lot. But let's talk about the players they traded in. That was Asava Radagalia as a key defensive option. Also, Brendan Zirk Thatcher. So it's going to be a very different look in terms of their tours down back this year. They also recruited to Ruckman, Ivan Solder and Jordan Sweet. Solder, you'd probably imagine, is the number one ruck going for them uh, going forward, given that Scott Lysett has retired. Jordan Sweet, probably a depth option at this point. And then their draft picks, obviously, they entered the draft fairly late, did a bit of live trading and got a few targets in. Tom Anastasopoulos, uh, Lachlan Charlson, and Will Lorenz went in the national draft. There's two pressure forwards there, and then a, uh, a clever crafty outside men and Will Lorenz, who I uh, quite like the look of pre-draft. And then a pretty high potential rookie list option in Xavier Welsh, 195 centimeter key forward out of WA, who again, uh, I think has a lot of talent. So that one could be boom or bust, but I do like that pick for them. Cool, so let's talk about their best 22. And uh, none of these have been easy. Uh, this one was, wasn't difficult, but there was a few line ball decisions. And I think the team that I've actually put here um, I will probably imagine changes throughout the course of the season, but I'll talk about specifics in a moment. So, uh, obviously, I've got the, the players in yellow there and, and new players to their club. Specifically, you've got uh, the two key back options there in Asava Radaglia and Brandon Zirk Thatcher. That comes to just um, refresh and potentially revitalize this back six. So I think they they had a few injuries this year. I want to say Trent McKenzie was playing a lot as a key back. He's unlucky not to make this team. He played 19 games, I think, last year. But Asava and Brandon Zirk Thatcher are a few more longer-term options for them and uh, creates a nice sort of balanced back three in terms of their tools. I think Alira Alira is still the clear best player out of that lot. Uh, but uh, Tom Jonas is another one uh, who they have now replaced. So uh, that back six is is good. Uh, the other actual thing I notice about this is that it's competitive for medium-sized defenders in this team. Like Miles Bergman now, I've pushed up onto a wing. Uh, there's Burn Jones I've got on the bench there. I think he played a bit of forward this year. Uh, there's Lockie Jones to consider. So that part of the list is quite competitive. Josh Sin is another one um, that was a first round draft pick in 2021. But that's the back six I went with, with Burn Jones probably on the bench. Again, it's um, a little bit on the outside as to where exactly they intend him to play this year. But the wings was probably the, the, part, of the part of the ground I think Port Adelaide are a little bit weak in at the moment. So Miles Bergman is a good defender. I don't know to what extent he will transition as a, like, a longer term uh, wingman that remains to be seen but he's a good quality player so I've chucked him on the wing for now um, and then Kane Farrell on the other side again like not a bad player but I'm not too sure if this is the most dangerous wing mix when you consider probably the gap between the inside on ballers in, in like Butters, Rosie and Ollie Wines uh, it, it's a little bit top heavy in that sense what Port Adelaide are kind of blessed with in a way is uh, some good tall forward marking options so I Look, I've put Charlie Dixon in this team, and I, from the research I gathered that Port Adelaide fans are a little bit mixed as to whether Charlie Dixon comes into this team. Todd Marshall will be there. I think he kicked 45 goals last year. He's coming along pretty nicely, you'd have to say. And Ollie Lord was a bit of a revelation this year, and I've chucked him in a forward pocket. But to be honest, I don't know if they'd actually line up like this. It could be one of those things where, you know, by round one there, they don't want to necessarily drop Dixon. It's probably suboptimal to play Lord and Dixon and Marshall on the same forward line when they've got a couple of third tall options there. Jeremy Finlayson, who kicked 38 goals last year, and Mitch Georgiatis as well, coming back from that ACL. So Georgiatis is unlucky. I left him out of this team. But to be honest, I think what we could see over the course of this season is that Marshall, Dixon, and Lord won't be the same, you know, forward three that they end the season with. We might see Todd Marshall, Ollie Lord as the true key forward, and then maybe Georgiatis ascends to being, you know, maybe he forces Finlayson out of the team by the end of this year. So that's where I see a bit of transition happening this year. But alternatively, like the, the medium forwards are pretty good. Like Horn Francis is probably... He's an on-ball rotation, but obviously can play forward. Uh, Travis Boak might play on a forward flank. I've chucked him on the bench here. Another player where it might be contentious. I think some people believe he's not in the best 22. I've gone conservative with this particular lineup, and I think he starts there and potentially gets phased out. Sam Palpepper, I think, as a pressure forward, was fantastic this year. He played, uh, kicked 31 goals and applied some real pressure and hardness to that front, front six. And Junior Rioli, 
Again, I'm an Eagles fan, so I'm kind of in love with what this guy's capable of at AFL level. I think there's still some upside there. And uh, I think as, as a forward six, that's a pretty well-balanced and dynamic team. I did pick McEntee as the sub, or McEntee, however you say it, uh, as a pressure forward there. I think that probably gives them the most flexibility uh, because, you know, potentially he goes forward. Horn Francis becomes a more permanent on-ball rotation if he's subbed into the game. But again, splitting hairs here because there's a few other options there. Namely, you know, some guys like, you know, Josh Sin, could we see him, you know, sort of picked into the team a little bit more this year just for the sake of his development? Again, is he a wing option? I think that's a potential one. He's kind of more of a aggressive halfback, but maybe they chuck him on a wing um, to develop him there. Who knows? Uh, Jace Burgoyne is another one. who I think he played five games this year, but you'd imagine might get a bit more of a look at it. Narkel's probably the midfield depth. Again, Trent McKenzie was an unlucky player not to get picked in this team, but that is the, the back six that I see them going with, and I don't think they would have recruited the two players that they did to leave one of them in the sand pool for round one of the season. So overall, I, I think they've done a good job of refreshing that best 22. I think Perhaps as an outsider looking in, there seemed to be a bit more of an over-reliance on the performances of their absolute young stars this year as the season wore on. And we didn't maybe see the same contribution from guys like Dixon. I know there was some injury in there. Lysett kind of, you know, fell off a cliff this year to some extent. Tom Jonas, you know, now they've refreshed that best 22 a little bit. Um, they could be setting themselves up for some more even contribution across the board, which I think will serve them well in 2024. So looking at like some, some ongoing needs, like I said, um, it's a pretty well rounded uh, best 22 there's some depth there particularly in the mid-sized uh, defender options where I'd probably be looking to improve that best 22 is a is a genuine wingman again like much could hinge on how Bergman goes in that role more permanently can Houston push up on a wing I know he's just an all Australian halfback flanker but is there a potential for him to play there could Burgoyne play on a wing Josh Sin is another one that I've just highlighted there failing that though Maybe a genuine wingman, but their hands are tied a little bit uh, in terms of trade. So they've traded out of, is it three consecutive first round uh, first rounds of a draft? So I think maybe 2024 will be their third consecutive one. So they don't hold a first rounder in 2024, and um, I'm not too sure if they'd be allowed to trade their 2025 first rounder. So I think the hands are tied in terms of like trading in a gun. So the, the two options are free agency, if they can somehow... Uh, manage to prize a player loose from someone or potentially a cheap trade option, someone who can genuinely play on the wing. But I think they also do need to preserve that 2025 first rounder. If I'm going to be trading it in Port Adelaide's position, I'd be trading it into the 2024 first round. What they do have is a couple of uh, father-sons in this year's upcoming draft as well uh, with Brent Montgomery's son, uh, Louis Montgomery, and then another Burgoyne coming in 2024. So what they could potentially do is, you know, trade that 2025 first round into 2024 if there's a live option available. I don't know, just thinking of some ideas that Port Adelaide could do to get creative this offseason. Because in terms of improving their best 22, whether it be through the draft or trade, uh, their hands are a little bit tired. But I do think they've drafted well. And like I said, there's, there's still a lot of talent, particularly in the back half, that is still trying to force its way into the team. So in terms of a 2024 outlook, um, look, looking at that team, I don't see any immediate reason why Port Adelaide wouldn't be thereabouts again in 2024. Obviously, you know, football is it's so multifactorial that, you know, anything could happen. Clubs fall off a cliff all the time. I mean, look at Port Adelaide in 2022. But on, to, on list strength, on best 22 strength, and when you consider the upside of their best young players, there's still a whole heap of upside. I mean, look at Jason Horn Francis, one of the most valuable young uh, prospects in the league and probably someone I should have mentioned in my uh, valuable players video. But it's a, it's a mature list and there's still some upside to go. I would probably assess that Port Adelaide, if they miss the top four this year, on 2024 rather, they're internally that would be seen as a, as a genuine failure. That doesn't mean that's my prediction, but they, they should be good enough to do that with, uh, with the star-studded lineup that they have and, and pretty solid depth across the board. I also think that their expectations would be a reflection of their list management mindset, which has been to forego you know, draft picks in the last few years to get some established talent into their team. That obviously indicates that they're here for the here and now. And I think Port Adelaide will be striving to at least make top four and be a genuine premiership contender because obviously with their finals performances, gotten thereabouts and then kind of shat the bed, respectfully. But there you go. That's kind of my assessment of Port Adelaide. I think there should be thereabouts again with a new look and refreshed best 22. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what sort of creative moves they do to uh, improve maybe their draft hand this year or 2024 rather, because they have picks 34, 52 and 88. But it'll be interesting to see how that those new recruits gel in this 
this team as well. But that's my take on it, guys. Let me know in the comments what you agree with and disagree with. Um, if you're a Port Adelaide fan and you thought this was um, you know, not a bad video, by all means, share it to other Port Adelaide fans. It's the off season, and honestly, I could use all the help I could possibly get. So thank you very much for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.